Something's leaving today, but something else is coming back. What's going? The Movember mustache. Gone. What's coming back? Movies about movies. The return of movies about movies. Movies about movies is back. Birdman. Yes, Birdman. It opened in the UK, New Year's Day. It's already been out for a couple of months in the US. Birdman's a movie about putting on a play. But Mickler, what's it doing in movies about movies? Well, two reasons. One, I don't have a category for movies about stage plays. Two, more important, movies are at the core of the story. Birdman is a movie that explores the yawning divide between Hollywood and Broadway, between celebrity and artistry, between artistry and ego. It's about what drives us to create and what sabotages that drive. And it's about love. And death. It's funny, thoughtful, richly textured, and it's also an astonishing technical achievement. Astonishing. But I will save that for the extras. It's a portrait of an actor under stress, struggling to engage with the people he needs to help him realize his artistic vision, and yet managing to keep them from hijacking his vision to serve their own. We see an artist as more than an isolated ego with a creative impulse. Instead, we see a whole person connected to other people, awash in their expectations, forced to accommodate the tensions that exist among his colleagues, in his personal life, between him and his spouse, between him and his child, his adult child. Collaborators can click or they can clash or they can dance in a complex pattern of click and clash. Birdman takes us inside that dance. It incorporates absurd fantasy and comedy. It's very funny, yet it takes its theme seriously. Danger and risk are ever-present. Death and disaster lurk just outside the frame. I love the tone and the tonal shifts of this film. Birdman has shown up on many best film lists for 2014. I think it deserves to be on them. Here's the premise. Riggan Thompson, former movie star, best known for three blockbuster superhero movies. He was Birdman, a fantasy character with powers of flight and telekinesis, but that was decades ago. And then Thompson got tired of being Birdman. He refused to sign on for the fourth Birdman picture and his career cratered. Now he's in his 60s, desperate for legacy, desperate for respect, desperate for self-respect. He's going to take one last shot to break free of being defined by Birdman. Thompson has written an adaptation of a Raymond Carver short story, What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. It's meant as a starring vehicle for him on Broadway, a vanity production. He's financed the show. He's directing and starring, and he's engaged family and friends in the production. So he is risking everything, financially, artistically, emotionally, and all of his relationships, all riding on this one last roll of the dice. Riggan Thompson, in his 60s, is doing what more and more creative people of any age are forced to do. Become not just an artist, but an entrepreneur. The film is directed by Alejandro González Iñárritu. It grew out of a single image that Iñárritu carried in his head for months. It became the opening shot of the film. A man in his 60s, in his underpants, in his dressing room, in a Broadway theater. Oh, and he's levitating, sitting cross-legged, back to us, just floating in the air. It's a striking image, a striking metaphor for the artist. Vulnerable, open, nearly naked, still hiding something, and possessing an uncanny power to transcend the ordinary. The film is very much Inuritu's vision, but to realize it, he assembled an extraordinary company of artists and technicians, beginning with the writing team. The screenplay is a collaboration by heavyweights, Inuritu himself, Nicholas G. Capone, Alexander De Nolaris, and Armando Bo. They spent two years crafting and honing the script. It unfolds with dark humor, brilliant ingenuity, funny, frequently scary. The film was shot by Emmanuel Lubezki, who won an Oscar and a BAFTA last year for Gravity. Lubezki will certainly be on the shortlist for the coming awards season. I'll talk about the cinematography in the extras. To play the part of the guy who turned down the fourth Birdman movie, Inurito cast the guy who turned down the third Batman movie, Michael Keaton. Bingo! Perfect choice. Keaton brings not only his extraordinary skill at comedy and acting, but also his biography and his filmography. In the strange way that movies work, we're watching not only the character, Riggan Thompson, and not only the actor, Michael Keaton, but also Batman and Beetlejuice and the whole cloudy soup of roles and not very memorable movies that Michael Keaton has played since he dropped the cape and cowl. Now, you might wish that weren't so. I have heard filmmakers and film lovers argue the point. You might wish a movie could be completely self-contained with the audience never distracted by what we come in knowing about the actors on screen. And actors may wish they weren't confined and defined by what audiences expect. Clearly, Regan Thompson wishes that, but not on this planet. Seth Rogen will never again appear in front of a camera without Kim Jong-un popping up in the minds of the audience. Inurito cleverly exploits our investment in Michael Keaton's history to give the film extra resonance. And it's not just Keaton. 
Other key cast members are also veterans of superhero movies. Ed Norton, who once played the Incredible Hulk. Emma Stone, who twice played the girlfriend of the Amazing Spider-Man. And in a small but crucial role as the New York Times drama critic, Lindsay Duncan, who played Captain Adelaide Brooke in the Doctor Who episode, Waters of Mars. It's savvy casting that amplifies the theme of the film. But these are actors, not just movie stars, and they're a lot more than their CVs. They're all working at the top of their game. Each one is bringing out the best in the others. The confrontations crackle with energy, focused intensity. You get a sense that everyone in the cast feels privileged and energized to be in this production and to be working with the others. It's really exciting to watch them work, especially Keaton, who just puts everything on the line. The score is by Grammy-winning jazz drummer Antonio Sanchez. The score is almost all drumming. Some excerpts from classical music as well. This is Sanchez's first film score. I'm sure it won't be his last. In the months between Birdman opening in the U.S. and in the U.K., Hollywood has flooded us with news about upcoming blockbusters from the DC and Marvel Cinematic Universes, a release calendar stretching out to the end of time. There'll also be three new movies from the wizarding world of J.K. Rowling, Star Wars, a whole series of them coming back and back and back. The Terminator's coming back. Jurassic Park is coming back. The Hobbit is back for one last bloated blowout. And the social media are all a Twitter about who will play James Bond, who will play Spider-Man. So it's not just Regan Thompson who's a prisoner of Hollywood franchises. It's all of us. Answer this if you can. Why have we allowed these corporations to nest inside our brains? Why does it matter to so many people who plays James Bond or Spider-Man? But all that aside, despite the dominance of blockbuster film series and franchises, independent film is thriving. 2014 has been a great year for original films. Birdman is among them. But ironically, Birdman wouldn't exist except as a commentary on the looming shadow of the corporate franchise blockbuster. If you love film, if you love theater, if you love show business, if you love the business of show business, or if you hate it, if you love New York, if you love acting, if you love cinematography, if you have creative impulses, if you've ever gotten in your own way, this might be your movie, Birdman. Until next time, I'm Mikola. DVD extras. Now, I haven't talked about the key technical and stylistic strategy of the film because, well, I didn't know anything about it when I sat down to watch the movie, and discovering it was a delight and a surprise, and I wouldn't want to deprive you of that. So discussing it is a bit of a spoiler, not much of one. You probably already know about it. It's in all the reviews. But at least I'm giving you this warning. Mike Nichols, as you know, died in November of last year. I've been watching some of his movies. Remember the opening shot of the birdcage? It's dusk. We're a mile or two out over the Atlantic Ocean in the distance. A narrow strip of light divides dark water from twilight sky. We're flying in low toward the lights. And as we approach, we see the lights are from Miami's South Beach. And we fly over the beach and seamlessly move across the boardwalk through the front door of a nightclub, past the patrons and waiters, right up onto the stage and past the performers. It looks like one continuous take, clearly an impossible shot. Well, it turns out it was, spoiler, three shots blended together. One from a helicopter, one from a crane, and then the last one not even shot in Miami. It was made on a Hollywood soundstage. The cinematographer who oversaw that miracle was Emmanuel Lubezki, who also made the even more astonishing, even longer continuous opening shot in last year's Gravity. It was Lubezki that Birdman director Inurito called on to film this entire movie as one long, impossible, continuous shot, or at least to create that illusion. It's been done only a few times in the past, most famously by Alfred Hitchcock in Rope, also by director Alexander Sukharov in Russian Ark, but never as ambitiously as Birdman, never covering so many locations, so many lighting challenges, interiors, exteriors, and special effects shots. The long takes raised a level of difficulty for everyone involved, beginning with the director who had to choreograph the actors and camera, and for the actors who had to worry that they might spoil eight flawless minutes by flubbing a line in the ninth, or for the cinematographer and crew, and then in post-production for the editors, for the colorists who had the job of knitting the takes together so you don't ever notice the joins. But there's more. A number of key shots involve elaborate special effects and compositing. Sometimes Keaton is in the scene twice, both as Riggin and Birdman, yet the camera never stops moving. Many scenes are filmed in dressing rooms with an abundance of mirrors. I kept waiting for a glimpse of the camera and never saw it. I wondered whether the camera had been painted out digitally or if the sight lines were just that carefully tended. I'm only mentioning that detail so you can relax about it. You will not see the camera, so relax. But the important question is, stunt value aside, does the no-cuts approach work for the film or not? The grammar of film cutting is something that filmmakers and audiences have understood for a century now. And it works not only because it's the way we see movies, 
It's the way we see the world. Our eyes flick from objects. Cut, cut, cut. We blink. And it's not just how we see, it's how we remember. Edgar Wright has raised analytical cutting to a signature style, parodied here by Sammy Paul of Ikeper Productions. I'll go and make a bagel. That is the opposite of Birdman. Yeah, but it has its disadvantages. But I don't think we're going to see a wave of movies done in continuous long takes. It not only puts a strain on the filmmaker, it's pretty exhausting for the audience, too. Watching Birdman, a part of my attention is always distracted. I'm wondering, how, how are they doing this? How are they doing it? And it's strenuous to watch a film without cuts. I think it works for this film. We're in a world of the theater, and in the world of the theater, things unfold without cuts. A very, very big thanks to Sammy Paul for permission to use clips from his Edgar Wright syndrome. Sammy's channel is here. Uh, he does sketches, funny sketches. And if you'd like to hear directly from the Birdman filmmakers, behold, playlist for you, including a short video from the folks at Technicolor who performed the modern miracles to knit together that one take illusion. Same team, by the way, worked on Gravity last year. And here, why that's my playlist on movies about movies. And finally, next up for me, some Doctor Who stuff. See you there. Bye now.